Welcome, everybody. I am here with Alexander Mercurius, the Oracle of London in London, and we have a very special guest. We have the one and only coach from the Coach Red Pill channel, CRP is the channel. Coach, tell people where they can find you, and I am going to put all your links down below in the description box as well. Tell them where they can find your YouTube channel, yeah, you your can Patreon, on, social yeah. media, everything. Let people know. Sure. I'm on uh, YouTube. Uh, the YouTube channel is Coach Red Pill. And my name, is, of course, is Gonzalo Lira, as you can see by my uh, slug line below. And I run the uh, Coach Red Pill channel on YouTube, and I also have a Coach Red Pill channel on Patreon, which, because it's not safe for work, because it's where I put all the stuff that would get me banned from YouTube, uh, you actually have to go to one of the links that I post regularly on my main channel. So just uh, go there. I think it's uh, patreon.com slash coachredpill, all one word. But you can find the link for sure at my main channel. And yeah, thank you very much, gentlemen, for having me on. It's a pleasure, as always, to talk to you. All right, well, let's talk uh, politics. Let's talk uh, geopolitics. Coach, you're, uh, we're going to kick things off with you. You're not in the U.S., but I think people can tell from your, access, from your accent that you've spent a lot of time in the U.S. Uh, what, is going, <laughs> what, what is it like to be outside of the U.S., and what's going on with all the craziness in the United States? And then Alexander can jump in, and we can continue this video uh, going forward. Yeah, well, I'm living in eastern Ukraine in the city of Kharkiv, uh, which is 40 kilometers from the Russian border. And to tell you the truth, here it is more free and open and relaxed and not as hysteric as just about any other place in the West that you can find. It seems to me, looking in, looking in at the West from the outside, that the Western democracies have lost their minds, as far as I'm concerned. We, we have over in Australia... Uh, the military patrolling people to make sure that they are indoors and in lockdown mode. Uh, this is essentially martial law. That's what we're talking about that's going on in Australia. In New Zealand, we have uh, additional craziness over a number of cases of the COOF that are so insignificant. I mean, five people have the COOF. Five people have the COOF, and you lock down the entire country. That doesn't make any sense. On top of that, in the United States, you have this hysteria over the jab, which doesn't make any rational sense. You have people saying that there are going to be vaccine passports. You have public officials, politicians, mayors and governors and whatnot saying that if you do not get the shot, then you are not going to be able to step out of your house. You're not even going to be able to go and get some groceries. I mean, th this, is, this is insanity. We, are, we have crossed the line of rational discourse, and we are going into the lands of hysteria. And I, I find it just shocking that here in Eastern Europe, the land of Putin, right, the land of, um, you know, the, the evil fascist of KGB, blah, 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 I feel more free than in any place I can think of in the West. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard other people say the same. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a person I know who's also based in your part of the world, who's an American, and he tells me ex exactly the same thing. But it's very strange because we've been through so many cycles. Of course, I live in Britain where we've had this happening very strongly now. And you can see kind of cycles coming. You have a situation where you're told everything's going to get better, it, that things seem to be improving, that things are opening up. Uh, there's optimism in the air. Politicians see their poll ratings rise. And then suddenly something happens and it's not so good after all. And we begin to see clampdowns again, lockdowns again, uh, uh, tension rising. Um, and we are already in that cycle here in Britain, too. Yeah, so, it's, it's a little bit like the Lucy and Charlie Brown and the football. You know that meme that we, we were all growing up that Lucy would hold the football and, and Charlie Brown would say, OK, this time you're going to hold it. Right. And he'd run. He'd come running racing. And at the last minute, Lucy would take away the ball and he'd go flying, you know, and kicking nothing but air. That seems to be what the politicians are doing to the people in the West. And what I find remarkable is the level of incompetent leadership, because we have, on the one hand, a power vacuum. And uh, a power vacuum in the sense that there isn't any kind of strong unified leadership like you see, quite frankly, in China or Russia. 
Uh, I'm not saying that this is necessary. I mean, I'm not saying that those governments are not necessarily repressive. I mean, certainly in the Chinese case, they certainly are. But what I am saying is that they have clear and decisive leadership. In the West, you do not have that. You have a lot of factions. And on top of that, these different factions that are struggling for leadership and fighting one another for leadership in the West, they're incompetent. They are just out to lunch. They don't know what they're doing. And so it's just a joke as far as I'm concerned. I I'm think sorry for being so outraged. You, you're absolutely right to be outraged, and I think you've hit the nail on the head, actually, because my sense is that the reason we're having these policies that change from one day to the next, but it's definite drift towards ever more re repressive steps, yes. is precisely because the leaders are weak, yes. and, they know, yes. and they know they are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, weak I, I, people I, I... always over... Overextend themselves. Over, yeah, over, exact, exactly. Yeah, and my thinking is that insofar as the United States leadership, I can speak with some knowledge of the American experience, and hopefully, Alexander, you can talk about the British experience. It seems to me that in the United States, and I've said this before, and so if I'm repeating myself, please excuse me, that there are four groups of leaders, four factions in the White House at this time. On the one hand, you have the Biden family, the immediate Biden family, whose goal, it seems quite obviously, is to make sure that the Justice Department does not investigate all their sordid little scams and, 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 and sordid little corruptions and grafts that they're carrying out. That's one group, and that group is around the figure of Jill Biden who is, for all intents and purposes, the matriarch and leader of the Biden family. I mean, let's face facts, Joe Biden, I mean, he's not here half the time. He's a puppet for all these different factions. So there's the Biden family, led by Jill Biden. There's the Obama faction, which is led, obviously, by Barack Obama, who is viewing the Biden administration as his third term and has a lot of people, his people, in key positions throughout the Biden administration. Then you have the neocon, I mean, the, the, the warmongers, basically, the Hillary Clinton faction, the warmongering faction that just wants more war. And the fourth faction is, seems to me, the progressive faction that wants a whole laundry list of insanity for no other reason, not because they care about the people, but because they are actively trying to tear the United States apart. I mean, that's their active program. You should judge people not by what they say, but rather by what they do. And everything that the progressives do is almost, well, it is designed to tear apart at the very fabric of the United States. And so you have these four different factions that, as you say, Alexander, they're each of them uh, struggling to impose more and more control on the people, trying to uh, wrangle the people, if, if not like throttle the people, you know, put a leash around their necks and get the people to do the bidding of these various factions. And because of these various factions, you have seen, and, and Alexander, you and Alex and Alexander, you guys have commented on this, of how American for, foreign policy lurches in different directions. One day it's anti-Russian, next day, oh, Russia, let's meet and be friends, you know, and this kind of lurching from, from direction to direction if you look at it from the point of view that they are these four factions, essentially, of course, there are mini factions and micro factions and little bridges between them and whatnot. But if you think of it as these four factions that are in play, things become a lot more clear. But it also highlights the fact that there is no unified leadership. And so all of these factions are all of them going to be doubling down on greater and greater repressive measures, which I think we all, uh, both you gentlemen and our audience, we are all going to suffer because of this. I think this is a. I think that's. that's in, I think you've put the nail again on the head. You've described it very well. Can I just say about the situation in Britain? Because in Britain, it's slightly different in the sense that the big divide in Britain, it's now absolutely clear, is between what you might call the sort of patriotic nationalist uh, uh, faction, which wanted Brexit. There's also a very strong libertarian faction, basically within the Conservative Party, which also wanted Brexit. And at the same time, you have a very, very powerful North London establishment, which is neither particularly patriotic nor at all libertarian, and whose instincts are very much aligned, both in some ways with the sort of Hillary Clinton neocon faction, but also on its sort of left fringe with the progressive fraction that you were talking about in the United States. We're a smaller country, 
So those people, the, the progressives and the Clintonites, if I can call them that, in Britain tend to be closer to each other than they perhaps are in the United States. But again, you have the same extraordinary instability in policy. So you had lockdowns last summer, then a major relaxation in the autumn, then a ferocious lockdown again, then a relaxation. Then we were told it's going to be a Freedom Day, which happened earlier in July, only it hasn't really happened. And now there's talk again of more restrictions and possibly more lockdowns. And the thing also to say is that the one thing that the government did at the start of this year, or rather not the government, but the bureaucracy did, was that they were able to roll out the shots very efficiently, as they did in the United States. And the success in doing that, which is a massive public image success, for a time papered over the cracks and made the government look popular. And I get the sense the same is the, true in the US. I read an article by, I think it was Byron York, who said that this is, this is the, the entire success, the popularity of the president in the United States is entirely connected to his success with the shots. What's happening now is that that's running out. There's more resistance from people to taking them. There's more doubts about this. The numbers case numbers, we are told, are increasing. We see a reversion to more repressive policies. Popularity of governments, both in London and Washington, is declining. And certainly it's the case in London that factionalism is intensifying with a very obvious pitch now by certain people within the government, within the Conservative Party, to prepare the way for Johnson to be moved aside. This is always a surprise to people, but when you hear about a lot of things going on in Britain, you have to understand that this is partly, these scandals you hear about are really all about internal battles within the Conservative Party, as Johnson's many enemies in the party are manoeuvring to remove him. Well, it's always struck me that Boris Johnson, uh, he, he, to, to speak of him as, as a man, he seems to lack ruthlessness, the ability to cut people when need be and to just strike once and for all. He always seems to hesitate. He always wants to be the nice guy. He reminds me, quite frankly, of Bill Clinton. Uh, you know, this, this incessant desire to be liked all the time. I've never quite understood it, to tell you the truth. Well, actually, Johnson is, a, is an interesting paradox because in his rise, he was actually completely ruthless. <laughs> I mean, he, he acted very decisively against David Cameron, who was our prime minister. And then he yeah, went and his friend, then he went, and his friend, absolutely. Then he went against Theresa May. Uh, uh, then he went well, against she had Michael, it coming. Michael. Well, she had yeah, it coming. she absolutely, she, ab <laughs> she absolutely did. But he was he, he dealt with her very efficiently. And very, yeah. very, very brutally. And also uh, uh, other former allies, people like Michael Gove and all, the, all of the rest. But he was very efficient and ruthless, becoming prime to, minister. To get to the... And yes, exactly. To, to get there. Yeah. Since he became prime minister, he, he seems to have to lost... He doesn't know where to go. Exactly. He's lost yeah. his touch. He's actually... He gets the impression many times of being bored... With with being there, <laughs> yes. which is which is a very strange thing. Well, you He's, know, you know, you know, what's that 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 saying? There's only the, the only thing worse than not getting what you want is getting what you want. And I think that that that's what happened to uh, poor Boris. You know, he got what he wanted. He got to be. He got the big job. And and the thing is, he he is a man who does not have a vision. He's very witty. He's I would think that he's fantastic in a dinner party, but he doesn't have an overarching vision for Great Britain. And so what you, you point out, and you're absolutely right, he was ruthless in his pursuit of the prime minister's job. But once he had it, he has not been ruthless because he has nothing to pursue. He just wants to be the prime minister. And that's happened with, frankly, a lot of the, the leaders of the last few decades, I would argue. Uh, George W. Bush, uh, uh, Barack Obama, uh, um, Trump, uh, um, Biden now. 
and, and Teresa May, for instance, another example of, of a person who wants the job and they are very ruthless in getting it. But once they're there, they don't know what to do with it. And they start uh, looking around for like this vision thing, you know. Uh, and uh, you, you have like people like Teresa May. Let's, let's talk about her. She did not have any kind of vision. She just wanted to make nice with everybody at the same time and wound up antagonizing everybody who found her weak, which is, of course, what she was. And the thing is, I think it goes to a core problem that we are having in our society in the sense of how we pick our leaders. We are picking individuals who have no vision. And also, we are picking leaders who, have, who are spotless, who have never made a mistake, who have never failed. I read recently how, uh, uh, the, um, and I think I mentioned this to you or to somebody else very recently, that uh, uh, the uh, leaders, the admirals of the Second World War, the American admirals of the Second World War, starting with Chester Nimitz. I remember the Chester Nimitz story most clearly. When he had been on his first command, when he was uh, barely a commander, he ran his ship aground. <laughs> you know, this is a major boo-boo, you know? On your first ship, he ran it aground. And today, in today's military, in today's leadership uh, a cupola in the Western democracies, such a mistake would mean the end of his career. But in the past, there was a sense that, okay, he's a very talented officer. He screwed up. And of course, when you're very talented, you are going to screw up. You're going to make big mistakes. And so we'll let it slide and allow him to continue his career. Well, we'll give him a spanking, but we're not going to cripple his career. And, of course, Chester Nimitz wound up being the commander-in-chief of the naval forces in the United States during the Second World War, and, you know, we all know the story. Uh, but today, people who are rising, if they make one mistake, they are eliminated from competition. And so we are breeding a leadership class, and I say that word very consciously, we are breeding a leadership class that is so incredibly conservative. I'm not talking about politically conservative in the sense of left or right. I'm talking uh, uh, psychologically conservative. They never dare take a step. They never dare step up. They always want to look around at what the crowd is doing and do exactly what the crowd is doing. They never want to actually lead. They just want to figure out where the crowd is going and then run ahead and be at the front. And this, I think, is we're seeing it now where we have this situation where we have no clear leadership and therefore no one who is stopping and saying, okay, is this really serious? How serious is it? Who is it serious for? Let's get our ducks in a row and protect those people who are actually vulnerable and, you know, let the people who are not vulnerable just live their lives because it's absurd to cripple everybody's life, life is equally. And let's, sure, pursue medications, but let's really know what kind of medications we are giving people because this put, could potentially be lethal, not today or tomorrow, but maybe next week, next month, next year. But we don't have that leadership and it's a disaster. No, because, because it's exactly what you said. Leaders are so risk averse. What they're terrified of far more than having a disaster on their hands is a disaster that they're blamed for. <laughs> if, it's, if it's somebody else who can be blamed, well, yeah, that's fine. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's no problem. <laughs> so disaster is fine, provided you're not blamed. <laughs> they're always yeah. looking for that. So if you're going to hide behind the scientists, hide behind the scientists. If you're going to yeah. hide behind the bureaucrats, you hide behind the bureaucrats. But, of course, the, the inclination then is obviously if you're hiding all the time, then you're a little bit like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. You have to also, at the same time, give the impression to everybody that you really are this awesome, all-powerful, almighty <laughs> yes. leader that, in yeah. fact, you are not. And how yeah. do you do that? Well, you know, you do dramatic things. You bring out the army on the streets. You impose <laughs> lockdowns, which, yeah. you know, you're told this is going to work. <laughs> so you're not going to be blamed for doing that. And yeah. that's what you do. And that's, yeah. you, that's, exactly, that's exactly where it all comes from. And in Britain, um, you know, you see this every day. You see this in the way the media, the, the uh, politicians now talk to the media. I mean, the, the way they talk today is so complicated. It's so lacking yeah, in any clarity. 
But that's, because the, that's, you can't, that's on purpose. It's on purpose. You know, the more complex your language, the more you're bullshitting, uh, quite frankly. And that's always been the case. I mean, come on. You, you went to uh, good schools in, in England and whatnot, right? When you didn't know what the hell you were talking about, you wrote it in the mo- most complex and convoluted language possible absolutely. to obfuscate absolutely. the fact that you were completely ignorant. Yeah, that, that's what's going on. You know, people who know what they're doing, they can speak in simple language. And I, nobody is speaking in simple language. The closest one in the United States, at least, seems to be Ron DeSantis. Uh, and I, I, I've always been a little bit, uh, I'm, not, I'm not 100% on Ron DeSantis. I've always thought that he, there's a little something there, something a bit sketchy, but that's my private speculation. Is there anyone like that in Great Britain no. or Europe, for that matter? No, no. I mean, Corbyn, when he was around, had a vision but he was never able to articulate it in any really compelling way. He was no kind of orator. um, And in fact, to be straightforward about it, he wasn't a leader either. He was somebody who was thrust into a position that he wasn't really suited to. But no one else. There is absolutely no one. That's one of the great... Yeah, tragedies, but, but, problems today is that nobody, nobody that's, talks. That's by design. That's by design, though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and, well, and we talk about the leaders, but who's really pushing back on the leaders? You talk about media. Is any media actually challenging any of these leaders? Are they actually throwing any questions at them? U.S., Europe, anywhere, any type of challenging questions? Zero. And, and it seems it's by design that you have weak leaders in Europe. We know it's definitely by design in the United States that you have the leader that you have. And the one time that a leader who was outspoken, a little bit crazy, but spoke his mind and did things that were very unorthodox, slipped through the cracks and beat the establishment, you saw the hell he had to pay for it with Russiagate and Ukrainegate and and taxes and and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, all of this seems that it's by design. These people, I I don't know. My question to both of you is this. do you honestly believe that these these guys, these Boris Johnsons, these Macrons, the Biden machinery? Because I don't, you know, I don't even want to say Biden. The Biden machinery. <laughs> yeah. They don't. They don't know that they're wrecking their countries. I mean, they they don't know that they're destroying their countries. They must know. How much of a bubble could they really be living in? They, they must in- know that they're destroying their countries. They. They. I, I just. I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they don't. But I mean, you guys, you guys answer me. I'm trying to figure out the oh, why, no. the why. Because obviously these, these have to be people of some intelligence to get to where they are. Some intelligence. Well, I'm no, not saying no, they're, they're geniuses. Cunning. They're, they're, they're cunning, but they're not intelligent. Okay, exactly. cunning, yeah. clever. I, 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 they're aware of their surroundings to a certain extent. They don't know that they're destroying their economies, their cultures, their traditions, their religions, their small businesses. Their their everything. They don't yeah. realize this. Well, you're asking both of us, so I'll defer to... Yeah, you yeah, know, bra- to, to brains, we're, having an open, we're having an open conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so I'll defer to Alexander. You know, brains before beauty, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, Alexander, what do you think? I, 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 I think you... Again, I think I agree. I think they're mainly cunning. I mean, Johnson, who has been a journalist, who has, who's definitely... I mean, he's clever after, up to a certain point. It, it, clever in a rather facile way. I mean, he does have some understanding of some of the things that are going on around him. Most of them, in my experience, truly don't. It's very difficult. That's the other consequence of the emergence of the political class that you were talking about. The class out of which leaders are emerged today is so narrow. And in some ways, it is so professional. These people talk to each other. They don't really mix with people or uh, no. uh, uh, people outside. The whole no. They don't do that. Not not in the way that politicians used to do. You go. You don't. They don't go out on hustings really. When they do, it's incredibly controlled. What what questions are asked to them? They talk a particular language, which is very remote from people. I remember I was in France. Um, about uh, two years ago, and I was there, and I was watching Macron on television, and I was at a sort of <laughs> bar, and everybody was just there, and you know, you know, He's pathetic. I mean, the, the, their faces, as uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, their great, their leader was talking to them. It was just, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it was actually remarkable to see, and he he didn't even look like he was a real person on the screen. I mean, it was a very weird experience. But they talk to each other. 
They don't yep. talk outside the bubble in which they yep. live. They are very skilled in talking to each other within the bubble because they have their own particular language. But going beyond it, I think that they are profoundly ignorant of what is going on in their societies, in their, in their countries, in the world um, around them, if you're talking about the leaders themselves. So actually, yeah. I think they are oblivious to it. <laughs> yeah, there's also another issue, a class issue that people don't really talk about very much, where you have this, um, let's call it the international set. Um, that, that was a term that people used for the jet set before there were jets. They would talk about the international set. And you have to say that there is this new international set. You see it in uh, Western Europe, um, Great Britain, Ireland, uh, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. It's a class of people who went to certain universities, had certain experiences post-university, and they're all of more or less the same class. They, you know, a lot of them go to a, a certain set of investment banks, say, where that are essentially finishing schools for them, and then they move into certain postgraduate degrees, you know, like in, in the U.S., you, you get your Harvard MBA, you know, or your Yale Law degree, and they wind up talking a certain way, and they don't like the class from which they came from. They are, uh, they are um, arrivists, quite frankly. They are social climbers, a lot of them. Some of them came from upper class, like, for instance, David Cameron and uh, Boris Johnson. But some of them, like, for instance, Theresa May, um, uh, come from lower classes, but they kind of, like, turn their back on it turn their back and, and are embarrassed by it. Emmanuel Macron, for instance, he is, I understand it, just a, a very average middle-class individual who rose up through the right connections and um, very much steered by his wife, who was a very ambitious woman, who steered him to get to the pinnacle of French society, of this technocratic French society, which is international. And so they all are on the same page, and they view, you know, being a Republican or a Democrat, a Tory or Labour, as, you know, uh, uh, you like Real Madrid and I like, uh, you know, Barcelona. It, it, it's, it's just a shirt, but not an actually different philosophical bent. Whereas on both parties, you have the progressives and the Tea Party Trumpers who realize this, they are rejecting it, even if they can't articulate what they're rejecting, and want nothing to do with this international set. And this international set pushes uh, neoliberal economic policies, austerity to countries that fall into trouble, like what they did to the, the rape of Greece, quite frankly, um, and all of these, these, these programs. And there's something else that really bothers me. Once they get to a certain level within this set, they never leave. They never fail out. They are always there. No matter how egregious their, 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 um, their mistakes, they always somehow rise up afterwards, you know? And I don't quite, I mean, it looks to me like a, like a neo-aristocracy. And it seems to me as if this international set is trying to create, for all intents and purposes, a new feudal society where you have the plebes, the serfs, the, the little people, uh, who are anybody who's not them, you know? And, and at the very top of this international set, you have these massive oligarchs with billions and billions of dollars at their fingertips who are, I, I don't know, I mean, like, think of it like a feudal society, but where the national borders were, no longer matter, you know? That, that seems to me the transformation that we are witnessing from a, ne uh, from a excuse me, from a enlightenment liberalism into this neo-feudalism, this, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to get well, to this. I don't see, there I don't is know a purpose see what then to what they're doing. There is a purpose then to what they're doing. Oh, I, I don't think that it's a conscious purpose. I, I mean, it, I've never been one on big, uh, big on conspiracy theories. No, I'm not saying conspiracy, but it seems that there is a, this deal. Obama's having a birthday party, 60th mm. birthday party. 475 guests, 200 servants at his $14 million mansion on Martha's Vineyard right on the ocean. Yeah. It seems like they know, not only do they, not, not only do they know what they're doing and they, they know they're a different class, 
but they have no problem displaying that now as well either. I mean, it's, it's out in the open. And you said something really interesting, Coach. You said for them, it's a borderless world. Yes, it has become, for them, it is a borderless world. They get on their private jets, their yachts, they go anywhere. But every day for us, they're making it so that we can't even roam one kilometer away from our home. Traveling now is extremely difficult. So not it, in Ukraine. <laughs> well, sorry, not in Ukraine. In but if, if you want to go from Ukraine to, to Cyprus, we're going to ask you papers, please. Mm-hmm. That's going yes. to be the first thing they're going to ask you. Uh, yeah. Once again, my question comes, and, and I'll throw a specific one to Alexander. It's maybe they're not conscious of their purpose, but there seems to be a purpose. And my question, Alexander, is this: You have Biden printing money like there's no tomorrow. I mean, he's printing money like there's no tomorrow. You're telling me he doesn't have advisors on his team who are saying, yes, Biden machinery, we understand that we're this new class. We understand that we have all these privileges. We understand where we want to take the world and how we want to create the separation. But you just can't print money, you know, endlessly without destroying everything unless, once again, their goal is to destroy everything. I mean, there are advisors that do understand economic principles in the Biden White House. Absolutely. But bear something in mind. It's a political class, a political elite, a new aristocracy that is incredibly insecure. And that is an important mm. thing to understand about no. it. They, 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 right. haven't, they haven't been born to power in the same no. way that, you know, old aristocracies in Europe were. They haven't yeah. been elected to power. They are, they are in a very fragile they have a very fragile hold. And, of course, they're not competent either. And if you're not trying to run things, even if everybody around you tells you that you're wonderful, if you're not doing things well, you sense it. You know. And that makes them very insecure. And partly why you see conspicuous consumption is conspicuous consumption, like you've said, is a way of buttressing your own insecurities but going back to the points that coach was making at the start of the program if you're going to be if you're going to be insecure you're going to be increasingly authoritarian and repressive also you're going to bring out the riot police you're going to try and control what the media says you're going to try and control what the media says about you you're going to try in fact to make the media into part of your overall apparatus. And, of course, the very last thing, again, going back to the points that Coach was making, is you're going to be absolutely careful that nobody ultimately places the blame on anything for anything upon you. So this is a very insecure, very unstable, very incompetent, because it's not being tested, political class. In a kind of a way, it lacks self-confidence. But it does have a trajectory of travel which it is almost driven towards by its own insecurities. So to give an example, to go back to the specific question you asked about money printing, why are they printing all this money? It is because, of course, they need to have the economy goosed up and booming in order to prevent the plebs turning on them in the elections which are to come. I was reading an article by Dean Baker, who's one of the economists, the economic yeah. advisors that, you know, you mentioned, Alex, and he said that quite explicitly. He said, we need to keep a rapidly growing turbocharged economy because otherwise we're going to lose in 2022 and 2024. So that's why they do it. That's why they do all of these things. But it takes them always in a certain direction. It pushes them to be repressive, controlling, hostile to borders, hostile to institutions that might hold them in check, and it gives them the direction upon which they move. Yeah, it, it seems to me you're, you're dead right of their insecurity. They, they lack that, uh, that confidence that a true arist- aristocrat or aristocracy would have. They are very insecure, and, they are, um, and it expresses itself, as you say, in this drive to repression. 
Now, I can speak about the American political system over the next, uh, you know, three years, four years, up through the 2024 election. Uh, number one, Kamala Harris, who is positioned as the VP, and she is a finger puppet of the Obama faction, because Obama is the one who put her there. Uh, she is she is despised in the United States. I mean, her numbers are, I'm not kidding, in the single digits. That, that's the kind of approval rating she has. Everybody across the board uh, thinks very little of her. And the funny thing is that the more she is exposed, uh, uh, the more people are exposed to her, the less they think of her. Okay? And so the idea of swapping out Biden for Kamala Harris, which was clearly the game plan, pre-November 2020. Well, now that's not very clear because Joe Biden is quite obviously deteriorating right before our eyes. He is becoming, I, I'm sorry to say, and I don't mean this in a cruel way, but he is becoming a, a, a vegetable right before our eyes. Uh, but he cannot be swapped out for Kamala Harris because people would not accept her. So they are going to have to do something somehow. And do keep in mind, the third in line, insofar as the, um, the, the U.S. Um, the political system is concerned, would be Nancy Pelosi. And there is another figure who is despised. And not only that, the lady is 80-something years old. So it's also questionable, how are you going to have these octogenarians, these, um, you know, these vegetable people running things? Uh, you, you can't, because all of them are vegetables, as far as I'm concerned. You know, they, they, Kamala Harris, she's a relatively young woman, but she's an idiot. I mean, she, she, I, I, I question whether she has enough brain power to walk and chew gum at the same time, quite frankly. And that hysterical laugh of hers whenever she is uh, asked even the most basic but slightly difficult question, you know, it's just unnerving. But anyway, the point is, who is going to be at least the, 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 um, the putative standard bearer of the American Republic? Right now, there is no one. If this were a um, self-confident, uh, uh, booming aristocracy, a, a new feudalism, but with you know just righteous people who knew exactly what the hell they were doing, we'd be like looking around to figure out why well, there's so many potential candidates for the presidency of the United States. Who are we going to put there? But there is no one. And the idea of uh, a lot of Republicans say that Trump is going to run in November 2024. I think, quite frankly that between now and November 2024, uh, the, uh, this neo-aristocracy, let's call them that, they are going to do everything in their power to destroy Trump. They are hell-bent to annihilate him on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think, quite frankly, he's just going to be too old himself. I mean, the man is in his 70s. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I can't quite recall how old he is. But by 2024, he's going to be at least 75, if I had to take a stab at it, no, perhaps higher, older. Higher. Yeah, he'll be like okay. 70, 77, won't he? 77. 77, okay. 77 do you, I think. I mean, I think honestly, they're... you know, do, do, do you think that a 77-year-old man, no matter how big the ego and the insecurity, really has it in him to run again with all of these headwinds? Because it's not like all of them are just like bringing him along on a wave to the White House. No, on the contrary. It's hurricane force winds at his head. So I, I wonder who's going to wind up on top. I look around at the political landscape, and it's barren. There is no clear person that you could say, yes, this is a man, a standard bearer. And, and th this is a disaster because you have the largest military on the face of the planet with nuclear weapons and the, the reserve currency, and they are behaving in an irresponsible way. They are carooming from, from faction to faction going here and there, but with no clear direction, no clear agenda for long-term progress, both for their own people and for the rest of the world. And you yourself, Alex, did a really, really good uh, analysis of the re recent meeting between, um, what was her name? Her name slips my mind right now. Save me here. You, you, the, the woman from the State Department, the, the U.S. Oh, Wendy uh, Sherman, Wendy Sherman. Wendy Sherman, yeah. <laughs> Talk about that, because that was, that was damn funny, if you ask me. Real quick, Trump is 75 right now. 75, 75, 75 now. now. He's 75 now. So Seven, he's going to be in 78. 78. Yeah. 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 No, no, I mean, when, when Wendy Sherman goes to, to China, meets with the Chinese there, uh, um, basically gets obliterated. 
by the Chinese foreign <laughs> vice foreign minister, vice foreign minister that she meets. I think no. I can't remember. He uh, returns to Washington, and this and is lies. Where the, and lies exactly. They pretend yeah. in a readout that she met somebody completely different. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, 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 it's 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 something I've never seen before. I mean, I know, she, I know, yeah. I know. It was funny. It was damn funny. Man. The insecurity, to your point, the insecurity. My God. I mean, I, I've never seen a situation where they pretend, they talk to one person and then pretend that they talk to someone else. <laughs> I mean, it was hey, extraordinary. Uh, uh, Alexander, let me ask you, what do you think the Chinese actually think of these shenanigans? I mean, what, what you, I mean if I were a Chinese uh, foreign, uh, foreign um, affairs official, I'd be mean, like, these people are a joke, number one. And I think nothing the Americans promise will be uh, um, upheld. All yeah. their promises and statements are lies. I cannot yeah. trust them. That's what I would think. Absolutely. You tell me if I'm wrong. Absolutely. I think you're quite right on both counts. They will say that, on the one hand, they are laughing because it is ridiculous. And I think definitely they are laughing. And remember what we said on the previous program that, that we did, that the Chinese at the moment are in a state of euphoria. They feel that they've got an organized, successful team. They've come a long way. They look at the other side. They see chaos and muddle and confusion and disorganization there. And perhaps the danger is that's going to make them overconfident. So on the one hand, that. they are laughing but on and, and perhaps overconfident about it. On the other hand, you're absolutely right. If you go back, if you have somebody, you meet someone who comes along, meets with your vice foreign minister, and then goes back to Washington and pretends that she's had talks with the foreign minister when she didn't, uh, uh, and get concocts an entirely fictitious readout. Yes, which is, I'm sorry, yes. I mean, it, I mean, it, it is no... <laughs> conceivable bearing <laughs> of what was really said. Well, how can you, how can you agree anything with a government that behaves in that way? I think the Russians are already saying, you know, that the Americans are agreement incapable. Yeah, And yeah, that's yeah. actually I mean, how the Chinese feel. You know, the, Putin finally figured out that he can't trust the Americans quite some time ago. And, you know, uh, and you've covered this, uh, this de facto alliance between China and Russia. And I, I was always struck by that phrase that you highlighted, actually, in, in one of your previous, um, I forget, it was in the Duran or your own, own channel, where you highlighted that um, joint declaration that the Chinese made, how they are renegotiating their, um, their agreement, and then they called each other their priority partner. That's a clue. I mean, that's a, not, that's not a clue. It's just basically blaring out to the world that they, are, ha, they have each other's back. Okay. Now, um, I think that um, any, any, the analysis of Putin that is very clear that he realized he cannot trust any American administration ever. He passed that along to the Chinese, and the Chinese must have realized, yeah, they're absolutely right. I mean, of course, the Chinese, they, they have brains of their own to figure this out. But, uh, yeah, their experience must now be we cannot trust the Americans as far as we can throw them. And this is a catastrophe because we are talking about superpowers. We are talking about nation states that wield tremendous military power. And if they cannot trust each other, if you cannot trust uh, the man who's holding a knife across the room from you, then you're going to grip your own knife a lot closer. And any little twitch of that guy across the room with that knife you're going to think he's attacking me, and you're going to think to yourself, you know, I'm not going to wait around to see if he's attacking me. I'm going to attack first. And so with all these stupid moves going on in the South China Sea, and this sort of like this weird game of chicken that the American military is, is playing, it seems to me that this is just a recipe for a war. I uh, did a long presentation on my Patreon, and here I'm, you know, shilling for my Patreon, right? But I did a long presentation. Uh, I, I do a weekly show that's uh, two, three hours long. And I basically posited that there is going to be a war between China and the United States. And my timeline, and you guys, I'd really love to, to know your, your, your thoughts on this. My thinking is both the Chinese and the Americans want a war for very different reasons. The Chinese, because they want to capture Taiwan. It's just, it's just itching at them. And over the last five years, uh, China, Xi Jinping, 
uh, is trying to uh, um, ho hold tighter to the power that he has and control everything all the more. And this has inevitably led to nationalism that will, that will find expression in an invasion of Taiwan on the one hand, and which is why the Chinese would want such a war. And whereas the Americans, there are different factions of these different factions who want a war because it would benefit them to, in, to different extents. And, you know, politically, economically, and what have you. And so both sides seem to me to be gearing up for a major war. And my window is basically between the February um, Olympics in China and the November election in the United States. That both sides, I mean, the Chinese would not ha want to have a war before those Olympics because, as you know, face is such a huge issue with the Chinese, and they want to host that Olympics. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's a little bit irrational. It's incredibly irrational, but, you know, a lot of times nation states make decisions based on irrationality, and this is one of them. And so the Chinese, I think that they would go for a war after those Olympics, and the Americans would go for a war before the election so as to, you know, rally everybody to the flag and, and get the Democrats to win the 2022 election. And so my thinking is the summer of 2022 is when we're going to see huge, huge increases of tension and eventually breaking out into war. What do you guys think of this? I, can, can, I, I just, can I just put some dates, Alexander, real quick yeah. before you answer yeah. that? Uh, just a couple of things. Um, Wendy Sherman reminds me a little bit, what's going on with her reminds me of Victoria Newland. So people are laughing, but we all saw what happened in Ukraine. So, Alexander, you want to address that? And going to Coach's point, Alexander, keep in mind that when Ukraine did go down, you also had an Olympic Games, and that was Sochi. And the date of those Olympics were the 23rd of February 2014, and they pretty much coincided uh, with what was going on in Ukraine as well. They came a little afterwards, so while Russia was preparing for those very Dis important distracted. Sochi Games, distracted. And I remember there were a lot of protests and a lot of media uh, stuff going on with regards to Ukraine and uh, and those Sochi games. So Ooh, they tried point. to distract. Yeah, good they point. they really did try to uh, ruin those games for uh, Russia. There, so two things: Newland Sherman sounds very familiar, and of course you have the Olympic Sochi, and now you have the Olympics coming up in uh, China as well, Alexander. Uh, absolutely, and don't don't you know underestimate the possibility that we could have a, an event. Time to coincide with the Taiwan with the with the with the with the games the the I mean for example a declaration of Taiwanese independence whilst the games are underway I mean I'm not saying that's what's a going slap to happen in the face. but exactly yeah. I mean the kind of thing that uh, ju just as the Russians I mean it was actually I have to say this it was very skillfully done because if you go back to 2013 there was a sort of rumble about you know there might be a boycott of the Sochi games and. The entire Russian bureaucracy was focused on that and they didn't actually keep an eye on what was going on in Kiev until it was too late. And it, and it basically slipped, slipped out of their hands. So you could see something very like that. And with China, it might be even more important because exactly as you said, face is a very important aspect in, in Chinese culture, in Asian cultures generally. But coming back to the point about war, I've never in my life, and, you know, I stretch back to, I think I can remember events back to the early 70s, even a few things back to the 60s. I've never felt we are closer to a superpower war than we are now. I mean, I, 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 both sides are talking about war. There was a, I've just done another program for my channel um, and I was talking about, discussing in it, an article, uh, an editorial by Global Times, which is a, a, very close to the Communist Party, in which they say quite openly, we are preparing for war. And we're building up our nuclear deterrent capability because we want to frighten the Americans to deter them from attacking us when the war comes. They are absolutely, we, I mean, it's practically, it, it almost says it explicitly. So you get, you, I've, I've never seen that before. Now, when it was the Soviet Union and the United States, it sounds a strange thing to say, but it's actually a very stable confrontation. The Soviets yep. weren't going to march 
on, you know, the Atlantic. That wasn't really what they were about at all. The US wasn't obviously going to march on Moscow. So it was very stable. And they they were able, they did, they did, there were some hairy moments. There was the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was the Berlin Wall Crisis in 61. But they were able to talk to each other. They were able to sort things out. They knew how far each could go. Neither really wanted to push too far. And they understood where the lines were. With this, neither side understands that. You have a government in China which is purposeful and strong, but also insecure. And I think this is an important thing to say because the legitimacy the Chinese government has in China is very bound up with the fact that it is asserting Chinese nationalism and is aiming to reunify the motherland the Chinese motherland. And you have a government in Washington which is both dysfunctional and also insecure. And that wasn't the situation between the Soviets and the Americans during the Cold War. It is the situation now. They're each building up their forces in the Pacific at an extraordinary pace, and neither side knows where to stop, and neither side is in perhaps in a position where it can stop. So I, I have to say, uh, a military clash, I'm not saying it's inevitable, but I've never known one to be more likely. And I really think people around the world need to understand that and be more concerned about how dangerous the situation is becoming. I've come to the view, by the way, um, um, Coach, I, I know that you... Yep live in Ukraine, I don't think there's going to be a major confrontation between the great powers over Ukraine. I think... Oh, no, no. I, I no. just... I, I've come to the conclusion that's not going to happen. However that no. thing plays out, that's not going to happen because each side is determined that it won't. But the Pacific yeah. is different. And the language that's coming from each side is really, really frightening. Yeah, and so far as Ukraine is concerned, I live here and I, I try to keep my ear to the ground. Nothing's going to happen here. And my thinking is if there is a major confrontation, a major war, let's call it a war, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's a major war in the Pacific over Taiwan or the South China Sea over Taiwan, uh, what I do believe will happen is that Russia will invade uh, the east and south of uh, Ukraine. And take it over. Because you have to remember, see, this whole area, I'm talking uh, the oblast of Kharkov, uh, Poltava, Donetsk, uh, Lugansk, these are traditionally Russian territories. Would you throw the a live here. in there? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe. It depends on factors. Okay. But uh, all of this air of this land, southeast Ukraine, is ethnically Russian. They predominantly speak uh, Russian. They have to speak Ukraine because it's a government-mandated issue insofar as commercial transactions, but they prefer to speak in Russian. And a lot of times people will start to speak in Ukraine and just switch over to Russian instantly. Um, and the only reason that this area of the country is part of Ukraine is because in 1954, Nikita Khrushchev, for administrative reasons, transferred these territories to the Ukraine SSR. But it's not traditionally Ukrainian. Traditional Ukraine is Cherkasy, Kiev, uh, uh, Ivo Fran Ivano Franz Fran Frankivsk, you know, more to the west. The center and the west of what is currently Ukraine. But the problems that you, uh, you have here in Ukraine are essentially these two ethnic groups that don't want to live together. That's why you have this, uh, the, the problems in Ukraine. And so it seems to me, Putin, shrewd operator that he is, if he sees that the whole world is distracted with a war in Taiwan, which of course everybody would be just eyes on that, he would easily take the opportunity just to walk over and take over uh, these territories in Ukraine. Or, you know, somehow break the Ukrainians. Because the Ukrainian government is incredibly fragile. The Ukrainian state is incredibly fragile. And there are very brave individuals who, are, who feel very nationalistic, you know, yay Ukraine. And I, I, I'm not trying to belittle them by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm just talking about the historical reality, which is southeast uh, Ukraine has traditionally been Russian and was only transferred 
by Khrushchev's uh, diktat in, in 54, and, and, and th thus the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91, grandfathered in this transfer, even though the people here don't feel Ukrainian, okay? And so uh, that, that's my thinking. But an actual war, no, it's not going to happen because the West had its chance this past spring. And Putin successfully um, countermanded them. And I think also what happened, to, to a final a little pin, a little final note on this issue, what happened in 2014, the Maidan revolution and all that, it was the same kind of pincer movement, if you think about it. Because you, Alex, were talking about the distractions that were going on with the Sochi Olympics and how the, there were rumblings that the West was going to boycott those Olympics and some other moves were happening at the same time and all of a sudden you had the color revolution in Ukraine. And I think that that was very traumatic for Russia um, in the sense of like, oh, holy cow, they got overthrown and it was shocking to Putin and he got a lot of flack, Putin got a lot of flack for it in Russia, that he was considered weak, that he let this happen, blah, blah. So he learned his lesson and that's why I think he was able to countermand what happened in the spring of 2021. Um, yeah, and so... Yeah, I've gone. I've gone on long mm -hmm. enough. I'm sorry to have monopolized the conversation on this particular issue. Uh, but, but, it's, but, it's, but but no. But I mean, you know, yeah, you're, you're, good, you're on, the good, uh, on the ground. Yeah, go, go ahead, Alexander, just so we can wrap it no, up. No, no yeah. just to say, I mean, what you said is incredibly helpful, and of course, you speak from you know being actually there, and there is no substitute from that. But Taiwan is different. You oh, only yeah. have to, you only have to read what the Chinese are saying, not just read it, what you hear, what they're saying and what the Americans are saying. The difference is that the Chinese know what they're about, the Americans don't. Yes. But, also, <laughs> and I, 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 but also, I have to say too, I, I, I do wonder whether the Chinese also have really thought the thing through fully and understand the implications of what they might be working, you know, planning systematically and methodically for. But, you know, it may not turn out quite as well for them as they perhaps expect. I mean, you know, well, it's a I, very I dangerous it, it, situation. Extremely dangerous. But I think that the Americans are the ones at fault here. Yeah. Because they are, um, they don't understand, uh, the American leadership has a lack of empathy of putting themselves in the shoes of the person across the table from them. See, think of, these, of this, and I'm asking you both gentlemen and your audience. Imagine in the United States that the Confederates lost the Civil War, but Jefferson Davis and, and his uh, cabinet and, and a big chunk of his army retreated to Cuba and set up the Confederate States of America in Cuba and said that they were the legitimate American government in Cuba. And they were just sitting there, 90 miles from uh, the, the continental United States. And by the way, Taiwan sits, I do believe, 100 nautical miles from mainland China. And suppose they just sat there. What would the American response be? They would want Cuba back in the fold. And if some foreign power from the other side of the globe started making noises and saying that they were friends with Cuba and that they would defend Cuba to the death or something like that and started waltzing supercarriers around the Caribbean and along the uh, Atlantic coast, what would the reaction be in the United States? It would be quasi-hysterical. It would be like, what are these people doing? Why are they sticking their nose where it doesn't belong? This is our problem, our situation. And it would just exacerbate this, this problem. And see, that's the thing about the American leadership. They don't put themselves in the shoes of the other people, be they Russians, be they Ukrainians, be they Chinese. They, they have zero empathy or a zero imagination to project themselves into the mind of the person that they are facing to understand his motivations. I mean, I'm not saying this, you know, like, like we should all be like kumbaya and, and hold hands around a campfire, but I'm saying that you should be thinking of the situation from the point of view of your opponent so you can understand the rationale of what he is doing and why he is reacting to your provocations. If the Americans withdrew and just pulled back from the South China Sea and stopped being, uh, you know, uh, uh, poking the dragon, as it were, then the Chinese would probably ratchet down on the issue of Taiwan. And so it seems to me, looking at it from the outside, as an outside third-party observer, the Americans are just goading the Chinese into a war. But it also seems very apparent that 
Apart from it being a failure of imagination of the American establishment, there is a significant segment of the American establishment that wants a war because they think it would benefit America and benefit them personally. And so that's why they continue to goad the dragon, and that's why I think that a war is inevitable. I don't know if you guys agree that a war is inevitable, because I certainly do. I don't know that it's inevitable, but I think it is highly likely, <laughs> to use a British phrase. And, yeah. and, and that's already very, very alarming. I think, I think we are, as I said, closer to that than we've ever been since the end of the Second World War. A real great power war. And um, I, I don't think people understand that. But uh, the more I read and the more I hear what people are saying, the more I see, you know, I mean, the Wendy Sherman, meeting in Tianjin, in a way it's a case in point I mean yeah. whatever that was whatever that was <laughs> it, yeah but, but I mean it wasn't a dialogue I'm sorry I'm not laughing at you of I course, know I know, I know but I mean you know, it, it was uh, yeah, but, but it wasn't a dialogue between two great powers trying to sort of negotiate around their differences I mean that that it was, is, just, a, it was just a screaming match. It was a screaming I mean, match. I wish yeah. I could have been there. No. They they must have been going at each other, you know. And and by the way, you know this. Um, you, you notice that in the Biden administration, there's this habit that they provoke an opponent, provoke and just poke and poke and poke and poke, and then they they try to have a meeting with them. Have you noticed that this is the mo of the? Uh, do you know who has that mo? Tell Obama. Me. Obama. There is a very good uh, website, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, uh, called Naked Capitalism. Uh, they, yeah. they are, they've swallowed, unfortunately, the MMT Kool-Aid, okay? So their economic analysis, I wouldn't go for it. But they have one writer there whose name uh, slips my mind, Lynn something or other, who went to Harvard Law School with Obama. And she has related multiple times how her classmates despised him. Because he, they thought that he was kind of stupid and pompous, and they thought that what he would do, they, they would call him the Obamama meter, uh, which was he would take the temperature of the room, and he would, there would be a, a room full of people discussing or arguing, whatever, and at the end, he would sort of like stop everything and be like this ref referee going around the room saying, okay, you believe this, and you believe that, and you believe this, and let's see if we can come to an agreement. You know, th this constant notion that all differences can be resolved by some sort of agreement uh, and that talking for the sake of talking is always good. This MO of the Biden administration comes straight from Obama himself. I would bet hard money that it was Obama who pushed the Biden administration to request this meeting in Geneva with Putin. It was the Obama administration that pushed for this meeting with the Wendy Sherman, with uh, the Chinese uh, foreign office people. I, I, I think it's that faction that is pushing this nonsense. And it's so, such a bizarre approach because they antagonize and they want to talk. It's just like, you know, you know, I just like poking somebody and like, oh, let's talk now. Oh, you don't want to talk here? Let me poke you some more. Oh, what the hell? I, yeah, I don't no, get it. Yeah, I don't yeah. get it. Well, it, can I just say, actually, it's a very interesting point. I never thought of it, but it's a legal tactic. <laughs> it, 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 it's what it's what litigators sometimes do. Yeah, the, you're the, right. The, I hadn't the, thought of it. The, the, You're the, absolutely and, right. And of course... And of course, Barrack, let's remember, is a lawyer. Yeah, he's a lawyer. He's not a lawyer. A very good one, not a very yeah. good one, and more more an academic, really, than a practitioner. A lousy academic, I've a, heard. Okay. A, lousy, a lousy academic and no kind of practitioner. But look, it, look, it, if, it, we, it is. If we want to be, you, I'm sorry, if we want to be honest about uh, Barack Obama, he was the affirmative action president. Yeah. He was a man of limited yeah. ability. Yeah. who, through a fluke of luck, wound himself beating Hillary Clinton in the uh, Democratic primary, largely due to the help of Ted Kennedy. Let's, let's face facts. Ted Kennedy had some axes to grind, and, and you wanted, you wanted to stick it to Hillary for stuff going back to the 90s. And so he was the one who gave Barack Obama the, the push over the top. And, and by the way, that proved that Hillary Clinton was a lousy candidate. But anyway, he lucked into the White House into the positions of power that he has. He has never held executive authority. He's always been a professor, and not a particularly good one, or a, a uh, parliamentarian with zero power. He was never an executive. His administration is eight years. He didn't accomplish anything except the catastrophic Obamacare, which is just a disaster. It's a weight around the healthcare system of the United States. Yeah, I, I, I despise him. I think that he's one of the worst presidents uh, in, in, 
it's certainly in living memory. Well, there's a lot of candidates for that uh, that particular moniker, but I think in in American history. But I'm sorry, I'm I'm no. babbling as usual. <laughs> never but, babble. But he knows he, how to never throw a babble. party. Yeah, <laughs> he knows how to throw a party, and he also, by the way, the other, the other, the well, other. I didn't get invited, so it no. can't be that good. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the other thing about him, which I have heard from people who were there. Who've been, you know, yeah. around him? Yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've met him. Is that he always believes that he's the cleverest person in the room? Yes, he, I've which heard is the same. incredibly grating. I mean, it's something oh, yeah. that really annoys people, especially mm. when he meets with foreign leaders. He barely got on with anybody. He only, what the only person he got on with at all was Merkel, who yeah. um, somehow who managed sucked to, up to him. Sucked, uh, sucked up, up to him. But, yeah, but Merkel knows how to manage people, manage yeah. egos. She's Absolutely. good at that. She is yeah. good at that, but that that was it, yeah. Really, yeah, yeah. Uh, that I, I've heard the same thing that he is just insufferable, and he also has this mentality, and and this is indicative of the current administration because, like I said, the o- Obama faction is neck deep in the o- in the Biden administration. He has this habit of thinking that if people don't agree with him, he either um, he has to explain himself better. It's all a problem of his messaging. He believes that whatever conclusion he has arrives at, arrives at is the only conclusion. And that if somebody disagrees with him, it's not that they have better reasons or reasons of their own or because of their situation, they follow a different path. No, it must be that he's not expressing himself properly. It's a messaging problem. And, and that is just an arrogance that is on another level. I mean, Jesus Christ. But I, I don't know. What do you think is going to happen, man? I mean, honestly, what do you... What, what, you know... Break out the crystal ball and let's just speculate for the hell of it. What do you two, think is going to happen? Two, two possibilities. Possibility one, we will have a war in the Pacific, and that's becoming really likely. Possibility two, a major economic political crisis in, in Europe and or the United States, probably both at the same time, because the way they, the two feed on each other. The only question is, which will happen first? <laughs> That's, it seems to me, I mean, it's rather bleak, yeah. uh, rather bleak prediction. But uh, I, I, I the, mean, the trajectory you, you, in both cases is unsustainable. I mean, you think that we're just about to head off a cliff. It could yeah. be a war. It could be a financial crisis. Yeah. It could be something. But yeah. y- you are the opinion that we're about to head off a cliff, right? I'm afraid so. Yeah. I suppose certainly, certainly the economics just don't add up. I mean, they, they, they are, they are, oh, no, no. they are, they are delusional. No sense at all. They, they, they totally make, delusional. Exa- exactly. And the, the politics in the Pacific are just also, I mean, unbelievably dangerous. So it's going to be one or the other. You know, I'm a huge fan of uh, the Godfather, both the movies and the book. You know, the, and and uh, in the book, I forget if it was in the movie as well. But Pete Clemenza, you know, the one of the capo regimes for the Don. He was talking to Mike one, one time after the whole war started with the Turk, Salazzo, right? And he's talking to Mike and he says, you know, these wars, you know, they happen every period, periodically. You need a war to clean out the bad blood, right? Bad blood in the sense of the, the antagonism between the different families and also because of the, the bad blood of the, the bad members in each of the families, the, the, the not very capable ones, the dead weight, that kind of thing. That was the impression at least given. And I, th- I think that that might be a very wise point of view, that maybe we're about to have like a big war to clean out all this bad blood. Because th- this, the past 75 years of this um, Pax Americana, that you can call it that, um, it's been a remarkable period, but it's unreal. It's not normal that we have gone this long with, you know, really, with peace. And the great empire that collapsed, the Soviet Union, collapsed without a shot. I mean, that is a a remarkable, um, that is unheard of. I I mean, I can't offhand think of any other empire that collapsed without firing a shot. I mean, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it collapsed because of the First World War. And the previous empire, well, the British Empire, but the British Empire collapsed because of the Second World War. But here you had the Soviet Union just gone from one day to the next and not a shot fired. 75 years of real peace that allowed people to develop incredible technologies, incredible industry, raise the living standards of the world's population. Before we had 40, 50 percent of the people in the world living in poverty. Now it's less than 10 percent. Most people have clean running water and have more than enough calories to survive around the globe, 
this, this peace that we've had is remarkable, and maybe this is the cost of it, this political chaos that is leading us to the going off a cliff, you know? You a, tell me what you think of that. A, a form of entropy, which gradually, yeah. bu which gradually builds up. Well, why not? I mean, I can certainly see that. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Because, of course, the nature of the international system has been to make really big wars, not, you know, sort of, I mean, it's, there have been wars, there have been the Vietnam War, there have been the Iraq War, but they've been yeah. contained wars, big wars, yes. big wars between the great powers became impossible. And yeah. the absence of those great power wars and the absence of any real fear of great power wars led in the end to a decline in focus and concentration and it has perhaps yep. made possible all of these other things that we've been talking about the the, the attempt to try to reorganize the world in a sort of globalist way these fantastic utopian schemes the collapse of leadership which we were talking about at the beginning of the program the fact that you don't, didn't really need a really real leaders anymore or at least you didn't think you needed real leaders anymore actually you do but it seemed yep. as if if you had yeah. Macron's in charge, nothing very much or would Ursula happen. Ursula von der Leyen. Oh, exactly, God. exactly, exactly. She's, exactly. I despise her. Yeah. I despise her, by the way. I'm sorry. I just have no, to say no, this. Absolutely. And this is a rant, okay? And you can excise it from your broadcast if you want. But I just have to say, Ursula von der Leyen is the typical rich German girl. You know, she has her horses, she married the right husband and squeezed out a few kids, right? And then she gets placed in different positions, not because she's capable, but because it's the fashionable thing to do to have a job, even though she's incompetent. She doesn't know what the hell she's doing, right? And she is the typical German aristocrat, uh, uh, the money-based aristocrat. Okay? I, I just really despise her because she's an idiot, and I despise the whole European project because, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's completely authoritarian and uh, lacking in any transparency whatsoever. But be that as may, um, I, I actually had a, 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 a point that I wanted to make before I went on this stupid rant, is that it, it seems, um, oh, about a war with China. The obvious question is, well, if there's a war with China, who'd win? And my thinking, and I very much appreciate some heavy input on this, my thinking is that the Americans would lose, and it would be a traumatic loss, that they would lose at least a couple of aircraft carriers, uh, precisely because of the Russian hypersonic weapons, by the way. I think that the Chinese would deploy them, the Russians would be happy to lend them out, and they'd deploy them to sink some of these carriers, and they'd sink a couple, because they are extremely vulnerable, even though people pretend that they're not. And the uh, allies of the United States around uh, the, the South China Sea would realize that they can't really go with the United States, because the United States will eventually leave, but China will remain. And there is no way for the Americans to actually invade China and overthrow the Communist Party of China. That's an impossibility, and to even dream about it is just absurd. And so the Americans would lose, lose huge, lose a lot of their allies, and be kicked back to the United States with their tail between their legs, having suffered a traumatic loss. I mean, a loss incomparable to anything since the Civil War, quite frankly. And, um, and they would not be able to regroup to confront China again because China would lock down, you know, the, the uh, Western Pacific. And I think that paradoxically, this traumatic and catastrophic loss for the Americans might long term prove to be very beneficial to the United States because it would give them an excuse to cut all this dead weight and this failed leadership. And on the part of China, it would actually, they would win and they would be euphoric because of it. But then they'd have the problem of Taiwan and having a conquered an island, because they can conquer it, sure. I mean, excuse me, they can capture the island, no question. They have the troops, the manpower, just the numbers to capture the island. But they can't conquer it because the Taiwanese will fight to the death, to the last man, because none of them want to be under the Communist uh, Chinese Party's rule. And so my thinking is that the Chinese would win the war the Americans would suffer a humiliating and, and psychologically devastating loss. But in five, ten years, the Americans would regroup and re be, be reborn. 
whereas the Chinese would be stuck in a forever war with, China, with Taiwan uh, and, and with just, uh, just burning through material and people endlessly. Mm. Uh, that's my thinking. What do you think well, of the scenario? I, 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 I'm going to say a few things. First of all, I think if there is a war between China and the United States, firstly, there is a very real danger it could spiral out of control. If, yeah. it, is, if it doesn't, and it is contained... Ass assuming, yeah, exactly, assuming it doesn't. Then China will win. I mean, yes, the, the balance right. is steadily shifting in their favour, and very rapidly. I mean, this is uh, at a speed that people, I think, just don't realise. So they, they would win. And the, the win, the victory they would get, would be absolutely as traumatic for the US, as you say. And for China, it would be a disaster, not just because of Taiwan, but because it would intensify the structural weaknesses of China itself. It would, it would consolidate a political system and an economic and social system in China, which is, as I said, as we've discussed before, it's actually brittle. It would be like the victory the Soviet Union achieved in the Second World War, which on the one hand strengthened the Soviet system in the short term, but in a way... Uh, did so in a way that was ultimately disastrous for Russia itself. So I, I, I think that is what it could do. You'd have a, a period of time when the Chinese, as you say, who are already very euphoric, dangerously so, would become even more euphoric. And it, they would take their eye off the problems they face within China. They would say, we are there. We've done it. We've achieved it. We're not going to change anything because we are so successful. We, are, we've, we, we don't need to change anything because why change something which has worked so completely? And actually, by doing that, they would, they would guarantee eventually their own, their own collapse, at least the, the collapse of the system that exists now. Whereas otherwise, who knows, it might over time evolve into something different. So I think, I think trauma for the US, long-term disaster for China, whether the US would come through its trauma, I don't know. I, 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 once, I once thought so. I was used to be, I've always tended to be very optimistic about the US. I have to say it's so divided today that I do wonder whether, in fact, they could sort things out. But, you know, I hope they would. But for China, I have no doubt at all it would be a long-term disaster. Yeah, my only thinking about the United States is if it is a traumatic loss, that the progressives might be able to slide in and really take over and really, you know, clamp down. And then it would be a disaster for the Americans as well, long-term. Because... You, I, I, to, to circle back to what we said at the, at the beginning of this broadcast and the thing that I find shocking is that all of the Western democracies are becoming totalitarian with such incredible swiftness. Canada is really a police state. It's shocking. And, and I, 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 I find it hard to understand how these deep-seated values of the West have just been have just collapsed. It, it's heartbreaking. It, it truly is heartbreaking. Well, we have an absolutely terrifying uh, a new law that's coming in Britain, which says that whistleblowing is now equivalent to spying for a foreign power, which says that a journalist who publishes classified information, say a Julian Assange, it can, yeah. be, can be prosecuted, convicted and sent to prison for 14 years for doing so, and which yeah. says that there is no public interest offence ever <laughs> under any circumstances. I know. I so, heard. I mean, this, I is, this is a terrifying thing. And there's also talk about doing away with jury trials. Uh, uh, what? So, yeah, absolutely. What? Absolutely. We're now... We're now uh, uh, oh, wait, I hadn't heard that. Well, I know. Well, 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 now it's starting to be the jury trials are going to be ending for initially certain categories of crimes, like sex, sexual assault crimes, but... It will evolve. And, and who's that. going to decide guilt or innocence? Well, the judges. 
the judge will make the decision by him or herself. So, and of course, who appoints the judges? So, and of course, uh, exactly, we're getting all of this coming. So, I mean, and that's Britain. I mean, you know, Britain, which is, has is this had, a done deal? It's not a done deal, and it is being strongly resisted. But as I always I say, hope. the trajectory of travel is terrible. I mean, it's absolutely awful, and it, it's getting worse. It's getting worse all the time, and I, for one, am really, really in despair about this. I mean, I, sh- I should I feel particularly strongly at the moment because a friend of mine, and he is a friend, who's Craig Murray, has just been trundled off to prison because he dared to provide reports about what was going on in a, in a case, a political case what, in Scotland. What, what happened? Can, can you right, elaborate? Right. There was, the, the, there was the former First Minister of Scotland. He was accused of sexual assault crimes right. by a group yeah. of Alex people. Alex Salmon. Alex yeah. Salmon. Um, um, Craig Murray and Alex Salmon and lots of people think this case was concocted, that it was orchestrated, that it was a plot to basically yeah. keep Alex like Salmon Stur- down by Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah. Yeah, who's so, uh, uh, really, you know, Catherine de Medici has nothing on her. Absolutely, yeah. quite right. That's that's a very good, very good comparison, by the way. So there's a, there was a trial. The entire case against uh, Alex Salmond unravelled. The witnesses were completely unconvincing. He was acquitted. Craig Murray covered the case. Um, he's now been imprisoned because of his coverage, because he said that he provided information which might just conceivably have led to somebody somewhere identifying who the accusers, who are still protected, by the way, by anonymity, even though their case against Salmon collapsed and even though the jury didn't believe them. Anyway, uh, Murray is going to be sent to prison for eight months and the judge... The judge who presided over Murray's case has now... Don't tell me, a Nicholas Sturgeon appointee. Absolutely. Has published, has now published a report saying that there should not be juries in sexual assault cases. So that's the trajectory of travel. That tells you all you need to know about what's happening in Britain. And the media in Britain is hopeless. I mean, there are... There's plenty of opposition, but you won't find it on the pages of the of the newspapers here or on the BBC. No, and the recent thing that's been going on is that, uh, you know, uh, what's her name? Um, Pasaki, the, uh, I forget her first name right now. Jen. The, the Jen Pasaki. Yes, thank you. The Jen Pasaki, who is the uh, 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 spokeswoman for the Biden administration, said that if somebody is deplatformed from one social media company, they should be deplatformed from all of them. And lo and behold, less than two weeks later, you have this combined database uh, that uh, I do believe um, Google and Reddit and a bunch of other tech companies are all getting together. They're going to pool the information of their subscriber, of their uh, user base, so that they can, you know, if, if one gets, um, gets deplatformed, he gets deplatformed everywhere. He is non-personed like that. I, I find that shocking. I mean, I find it just... I like this dark humor because it's something out of 1984, you know, Fahrenheit 451 kind of thing. And at the other, on the other hand, I find it horrifying. And I'm like, this is stuff we all read about in junior high school or the equivalent thereof. How is it that people aren't realizing this? This is stuff, this is exactly the stuff that was drilled into us when we were 13, 14 years old reading those books like Fahrenheit 451, 1984, Brave New World, all those books, you know, Lord of the Flies, that was drilled into us, this kind of totalitarianism, we had to resist it, and it's happening, and no one is saying anything. Anything, anything. (laughs) And and can I just add in Britain, I mean, you know, there's a collapse of legal ethics, collapse of media ethics. I mean, you trained as a lawyer, you were told to respect due process, to have certain, you know, beliefs about the rights of the accused. (laughs) It's all going away. I mean, it's just, it's just disappearing uh, with a speed and a completeness that I would have considered completely impossible. If anybody had told me five years ago 
that we would be in the place which we are in now. I just wouldn't have believed it. I just said impossible. No, I would have laughed at them. I'd have I would have said no. That's I just, just said you know yeah. absolutely yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the idea about like a like a pandemic, sure, that's possible. I mean, actually, a lot of very smart people were saying, "Hey, it's in the cards. It's it's going to happen eventually." Okay, fine. I mean, let, let's set aside whether this uh, particular pandemic is man made or 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 natural. No, it was in the cards, right? Y- you tell me, five years ago in two thousand sixteen, there might be a pandemic. Yeah, I believe it. Uh, you tell me that um, all this stuff is going to go on. No. None of it. I, I would never believe it that Julian Assange, for instance, would be held in the Ecuadorian embassy for seven years and then held in a prison in Great Britain now going on two years now and uh, in, in essentially solitary confinement and that nobody would say anything. I, I would say, no, that's not possible. I mean, uh, you know, Julian Assange, whatever you may think of him. Uh, you know, the guy is a journalist, you know, it's more complicated than that than calling him a journalist, Uh, uh, not an agent provocateur quite, but, you know, a high level troll is what I would think of him. But that all of this, all of these things, these different things that have been going on. And, you know, the thing that is incredibly depressing in American politics, it's slowly coming out that, yeah, indeed, that there was uh, malfeasance in the 2022 election, in the 2020 election, rather. And enough that it is likely that it changed the outcome of the election, and which is very obvious to anybody with even a casual knowledge of the, of the things going on in 2020. But the audits and whatnot, it's becoming increasingly clear. And the way it's becoming increasingly clear is because Twitter, for instance, recently suspended the accounts of a whole bunch of uh, people who were monitoring the Maricopa County recounts and audits and whatnot. And that's obvious, you know, a lack of confidence requires more repression. And once you repress one thing, it's just, it's just like, let's repress this and let's repress that. And also what I've noticed too is that the repression starts to happen in the following sense that people uh, feel that they are doing good by repressing more. And it becomes, repression becomes a competitive sport. Are you more moral than me? No, because I've repressed three people and you've only repressed two. You know, mm. I, I, I'm, it's I'm, compulsive. I'm very disorganized. It, no, no, you're not. It's yeah. absolutely compulsive because, of course, it's exactly correct. If you start repressing one thing, if you start to silence one thing, then you have to silence other things because those other things might reference back to the thing you've silenced. It, it is yeah, an exactly. inevitable. It's like lies. You know, one lie leads to another lie. One repression leads to another repression. Otherwise, the structure you are creating cannot stand. So you are you are you are trapped into a system of escalating control and repression. And at the same time, you probably end up enjoying it if you're a (laughs) certain type of person, because it gives you it gives you a sense of power and a sense yeah. of moral purpose too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Alexander, like, like I said, we all read these books growing up, the, these uh, dystopian novels that were, they were drilled into us, right? And, and it's happening right before our eyes. I've told my um, followers on, on uh, Telegram, I have a Telegram channel, it's called The Real CRP, or just Real CRP. And um, on the Telegram channel, I, I once did like a, like a, just a, it was just a throwaway idea. What would you think about establishing a distant enclave in eastern Ukraine? And I got, I got uh, uh, 60% were in favor of it. Okay. And a substantial portion of that, I mean, roughly half of those people said that they actually could move there and continue to earn a living from eastern Europe if there was a dissident enclave that they could go to. And I was like, holy cow, you know, and this was just a, a throwaway idea. You know, it was like just, just a random idea. And I popped it in and it was actually the, um, the post that, that is the, one of the most viewed, it's like the second most viewed of all my posts. And this uh, poll had a couple of thousand votes. And so it, the fact is, it's not just you, you guys and myself and other people who are quote unquote online influencers. I've always despised that, that saying, but um, it's regular people. Regular people feel the squeeze. And if regular people are feeling the squeeze, eventually I think, I hope, that the regular people will coalesce and lash out. Yeah. But 
I've been thinking that for a number of years, and it still hasn't happened. Yeah. Well, because historical time, and we, that's what we're talking about, is long. Political time is very short, but historical time is long. And when I talk about long, I mean in terms of years. One year, five yep. years, ten. That isn't a long time in, histor- in history. It's a very long time in politics. It's, in the, it's a very long time in the life of a human being. So, you know, if you lived in France in 1780, you still had nine years to go before you got 1789. Yep. So we might be in 1780, but we still have nine years ahead, and that might be a very long time. So that's, that's yeah. always the thing to bear in mind about this. Things which, from a distance, look like they've all happened in a very short time frame can look, when you're living through them, as if they're taking a very long time to take place. I believe you're absolutely right. I think this is completely unsustainable. Alex was talking, I think before we started this programme, about how exhausting it is to constantly use this complicated language where we can't use ordinary words. People must be increasingly frustrated when they go on to things and they find that what they're hearing on the media, what they're listening on television, doesn't reflect their everyday realities. We see trust in government, in media, everything is collapsing. And you talked about the entropy of leaders and the entropy of the political system. So all of these are signs of decay. They may not happen tomorrow. They may take 10, 20 years to happen. But that isn't, as I said, in terms of historical time, a long time. But in in terms of our lives, unfortunately, it's a very large part of them. What do the Chinese say? May you live in interesting light times. Our times are nothing <laughs> if not interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the future on all fronts. And I, I, I'm not being hyperbolic. And I, 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 because what is going on is unprecedented on every front. And, you know, talking about like the, the money situation, it's catastrophic. And it is heading for a crash. And the other thing... Um, I think the thing that really bothers me is that barely two years ago, you could speak frankly about things. Actually, I'm thinking of 2018, actually three years ago. You could speak frankly of things. And uh, to, to uh, tell your audience something that the, the three of us discussed right before we started the, the broadcast was that we agreed that certain, we wouldn't mention certain words because the algorithms would pick up on those words and potentially get us into trouble. That is the kind of mentality that you have in the Soviet Union during the 60s and the 70s. And, and that is happening today, that we are self-censoring and saying, oh, let's not use that word. We'll use a euphemism for it. And we all know the words that we're talking about. This is crazy. This is diametrically opposed to everything that the, West, the Western democracies are supposed to um, believe in and, and hold as principal values. And I, I, I do not understand how this has happened so quickly. Again, okay, you're absolutely right. I, I know. You're, you're, you're absolutely you're, right. And it goes also back to the point that we made before about the fact that leaders today can't really talk anymore because they are also, to a great extent, uh, uh, tied down by language. They can't th- say things straightforwardly and simply. One of the, for me, one of the most striking events of the Trump period, was his first inaugural address, which I found when I read it, I didn't think it was anything very much one way or the other. But people were absolutely furious about it because he didn't use the language, the correct language that is now expected. And he spoke spoke directly instead of, you know, ladling his speech with the cliches and these, you know, the sort of kind of language that is now used, whereas Biden's inaugural address was all of, was entirely that. And you read, yeah, yeah. you read about 
that it was the greatest inaugural address since Lincoln, or was oh, it yeah. Roosevelt, or whatever? I mean, what, it was, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, it was just, it was just the most pedestrian thing. It was completely forgettable, you know. And, and well, certainly Joe Biden forgot about it, even as he was reading it. <laughs> the rest of us, shortly thereafter. Well, exactly. <laughs> but, Who remembers uh, you know, it now? <laughs> I mean, I don't. I mean, yeah. not, not a word. Not a word. You know. Uh, but you know, it, it's it strikes me that um, something happened recently. Um, uh, you know, I, I tend to. Uh, uh, you guys are like the highfalutin end of my internet interaction because you both are uh, just so well read and so smart and sharp, right? But you're on the high end because I go to some pretty nasty places, and on the on the low end of my inter- internet adventures, there's been this huge scandal about uh, an individual called Chris Chan. Chris Chan is an internet legend of the darkest variety. I'm not going to go into the details because it's sordid and, and uh, yeah. Anyway, this individual used to be a man and uh, transitioned to a woman, as they say. And uh, this individual uh, was caring for his mother, who suffers from Alzheimer's. And he was, uh, uh, there's no way to say it nicely, he was sexually abusing her on the regular basis. And he was stupid enough to mention this. Uh, on some recording, and the police, you know, did a welfare check and then arrested him on the very next day because it was just horrifying. You know, it's a horrifying scandal going on. But the point, this horror that this individual is doing, do you know what a lot of blue check marks have been furious about? That people are misgendering him and calling him a him instead of a her. That's the outrage. Not the fact that he was sexually abusing in the most grotesque way imaginable, okay? His own mother, who was suffering from Alzheimer's, okay? That, they didn't mention. It was the fact that they were, that, that we were misgendering this individual. And I'm bringing this up, not for the purient interest, but rather to highlight a fact that there is a substantial segment of our population that seems to view actual morality on the use of words use or misuse of words, as opposed to actions. In the case of this Chris Chan individual, he did horrifying things. I mean, horrifying. I mean, things that would, you know, make the few hairs I still have fall out of their follicles. I mean, I I used to have hair up to here before I, I heard about this story, okay? It's horrifying. But people were upset about the language. And there is such a huge group of people like that. And we have, on the other hand, like this uh, gymnast, uh, um, her name slips my mind, the American gymnast, who was on her team and then decided for her mental health that she was going to drop out. And I'm like, I, I don't recognize the people anymore. I, I, I don't. And, and, yeah, and with that very depressing comment, I think I should uh, step aside and step back because it's been a delightful conversation, but um, I don't know if you guys want to go on in any direction. No. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. We, 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 will, will, wrap cer- up, uh, we will We will certainly so, wrap it up. So, can, I, can I just end it with a poem? Because, you know, you're just talking about sure. speech. Uh, do you know W.H. Auden? The ogre does what ogres okay. can, deeds quite impossible for man, but one prize is beyond his reach. The ogre cannot master speech. About a subjugated plain, among its desperate and slain, the ogre stalks with hands on hips, while drivel gushes from his lips. <laughs> so appropriate. So appropriate. Yes, an, an Irish poet at that. All right. Alexander Mercurius in London. Thank you very much. Coach Red Pill, where can people find you once again? Thank you very much for having me on. You can find me at uh, Coach Red Pill on YouTube and on Patreon at patreon.com slash Coach Red Pill, all one word. We will put everything in the description box down below. Thank you very much, Coach Red Pill. Take care, everybody.